Can you envision a future with no more WGS satellites being built? Yes or no? <laughs> I don't know, but I think the future looks, looks bright um, for increasing use of commercial, and I think certainly from affordability and flexibility, it has shifted, and, uh, and I think we're, we're seeing DOD lean more forward to take advantage of commercial. So I think future looks bright. I, I would certainly echo that the, the future looks bright, but when you look at uh, WGS versus commercial, um, a purpose-built satellite does more things. And that conversation of whether or not it will line up in a business case with a commercial operator is a big conversation. DOD is somewhere between 5 to 1% of the market. How much leverage is there to, to do some of the more elaborate things? So I think that it'll be a mix. And, you know, how, how much of a mix we'll, we'll sort through. But there will be a few requirements that just need to be satisfied that will uh, be of core purpose. Rick. I think it's going to be a mix between specialized DOD satellites like an AEHF and everything else should be commercial. Um, I would just say to do it right, you know, this is obviously a very space-centric uh, panel. There's three elements to a satellite system, the satellite, the ground infrastructure, and the terminal. Uh, Hughes is one of the largest providers in the world, yet we don't design satellites, we design satellite systems. And it's one of the things, no matter how the DOD goes, that I think they need to do a little bit better as those trades and make sure we don't have MUOS satellites, but we don't have MUOS terminals or, or FAB-T terminals, that type of thing. So as the analysis goes forward, I, I hope that all three segments of the system are, are looked at and the trades are made. Can you envision a future without any more WGS satellites? Kay. Specifically WGS? My answer would be yes, but I envision a future where the government will own some exquisite capability in, wide, in their wideband comms area, highly, highly protected, but the vast majority would be uh, provided by the commercial sector. And I'm going to foot stomp what Rick just said because none of that will make sense and interoperate if we don't get the ground segment right, and that's the real complexity of this. Well, I can't wait to find out. <laughs> uh, but I can, I can tell you that our goal is a flexible, interoperable, and resilient uh, SATCOM architecture uh, that leverages a wide range of uh, commercial SATCOM acquisition models. And so uh, I think we're, go we're moving into a period of time where it's very exciting to be in this line of business, and I, and I look forward to working with all of you to get there. That's so politically correct. Yes. <laughs> Peter, you get the last word. I'd say an emphatic yes, um, but I'd like to echo what uh, Winston said about the architecture. Um, I asked General Polakowski four years ago when she was the SMC commander, I said, when are we going to have an architecture that looks at commercial and military satellite communications, try to harmonize the two so that we can have, you know, a complementary, with an E, not an I, complementary architecture between uh, commercial and, and military. And uh, I asked that same question to General Hyten uh, a few months ago, and he said, we're going to get there. Um, but it's been four years. I'm looking forward to seeing that architecture, and I think any decision should be informed by that architectural analysis, including the uh, WGS AOA.